right. Um, yeah, this is a request from Carol. Doing a Memphis Mafia. Blame the Colonel for what happened to Elvis. Um, not sure. Also, this might get blocked because Elvis stuff is a bit. It's a bit tricky to get past them because, well, to be honest, it's because his stuff still makes money. That's the. <laughs> yeah. It's still money makeable, so people don't allow you to use things, certain things. But this hopefully should get through. But if work comes to worse, I'll probably have to block out the um, screen. But let's hope I don't. Fingers crossed. But yeah, let's go. You know, when I first met Colonel Parker in Nashville at the recording session before we went to the to Sinatra show, uh, he didn't know me. He had no idea who I was. All you know was this kid from Chicago. I mean, he was a little leery of me. Uh, but why is he here, you know? And Elvis introduced me to him. He was, he was very nice to him, but I know that he was a little standoffish. So I really don't think he knew what I was gonna do around there. But then I guess after a while, you know, I was sort of the, the people that he would contact to tell Elvis things. And we got to sort of become friends. He realized I was doing a job that had to be done and I wasn't goofing off. And uh, he had a good relationship with a lot of the other guys because he knew them a lot more because they, like Lamar was around, Gene Smith was around, and he knew Red. It took a while, but then we became very close. And uh, I had a lot of respect for him. He had a lot of respect for me. And he knew I was doing my job. After a while, we became very close friends. Colonel Parker probably was one of the most degenerate gamblers I've ever known in my life. He played roulette and, and would put would put chips on every number. Uh, he would uh, play craps and bet the horn, the center. Uh, one night I was up about, God, I think I was up fifty, sixty thousand dollars. Remember, he, <laughs> I was just, I was running the crap table crazy, and he came up and took my money, and put it on don't pass. You threw and a I, seven. And I threw a seven and lost it all. <laughs> one pop. And I just, I wanted to throw up, but I couldn't. <laughs> and I said, you know, Jesus God, I said, I've worked my butt off here. I said, I've, he said, how much did you start off with? I said, I started off with 2000 So he counted out $2,000 and gave it to me. He said, now you're even. I went, God, I'm my. <laughs> but I mean, he was right. I was even. Colonel, I, you know, I was Colonel even. Colonel gambled I, you know, in a way. I only lost $2,000. You know, we all have our little idiot. That could be, no, to be fair, his gambling could be what, made him take a gamble on Elvis, because there's no doubt that that was a gamble. A white boy doing black music, or black music, but it was at that time, it was, yeah. And for to put a white boy like Elvis in there, I said, that's a risk, that's a gamble, and, and it paid off for him. But yeah, that gambling streak is probably what contributed to Elvis's, um, to him, yeah, gambling on Elvis. That was his. his. Was gambling, and and I loved him to death. But he didn't play the game like you have to play it to win. I mean, he would go through it's, with those on roulette, and he would loss. drop five or six chips there, two on that one, ten or twelve on this one, and that's he, whatever fell out of his hand. Yeah, that's what he do. And when he hit, yeah. he didn't really win because he had more mm. bet than what it was. But he thought off. he did. Yeah. I mean, listen, one night in between shows. <clears throat> this was in 70, and we were at the crap table. And he called me and said, listen, he said, you gotta stay with me here. And I said, well, I said, you know, I said, I've gotta go upstairs early. He said, no, you stay here. He said, I'll get you up there on time. And I said, okay, so. In a period of an hour and a half, he lost over a million and a quarter. I have, and I said, I turned around and looked at him. I said, you know, you gotta be wealthy. I said, I, good God. He said, well, it all works out in the end. He almost became a shell for the hotel. You know, the way he he drew people it. to the table. When we were playing Vegas and I was going through, I got Elvis downstairs for the early show and I had to go back up to the suite. So instead of going through the back corridors, I went out the front and went through the, the casino and, and then the showroom. And Colonel was at a roulette table there and my wife was pregnant. As I went by, I just said hi to him, Mr. Parkhill, George Parkhill, RCA exec, always with him. And uh, Colonel said, Sonny, give me a number. I said, well, my child is due on the 24th of September, so 24. So he 
put down a couple of chips on 24. It hit. Straight up. The colonel said, why didn't you tell me you was real sure about that number? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because he only had two on there and he had other stacks of eight to 10, 12 on other numbers. And George is <laughs> just grinning. The great uh, precipitation of, par of problems was over his gambling. And I was believed at the end, the reason he was playing the hotels was trying to pay off the Colonel's debts. So I don't know mm. what truth there was to that. I don't know, but Colonel Yeah, we Elvis can't really Elvis, speak of his personal finances because yeah, we didn't Elvis have that. Elvis would consider it, it was a thorn in his side. And it really, really, you know, when they started that, when they were doing all that fighting, you know, they had me in the middle of it. Now there's several years from 1967 until mid-72 that I left on my own reconnaissance. And I stepped away from Elvis's world because there was a lot of resentment between the guys who worked for Elvis and especially Colonel Parker, who thought that I had an agenda that I was trying to take Elvis away from him and perhaps become his manager or lead him down a path that was contrary to what the Colonel had in mind for Elvis. I... That's a bit like Mike Tyson's trainer. But that could have come from, because Mike Tyson, there's a story Mike Tyson tells about Chris DeMarta, who was his trainer, saying that um, he was some promoter come over to him and said, good fight after one of his fights when he was younger. And he said, and I kind of went, oh, thank you, sir. And then, yeah, Chris DeMarta come over and said, don't, what did he say to you? Don't talk to him. But he said that come from him having fighters leave him, him teaching fighters and then having them leave him. So he had a, a real overprotection of his fighters because he had them stole. So maybe that's why Colonel Parker was so defensive of Elvis. Maybe he had other acts and they got took, stolen off of him and now he's a bit more wiser and a bit more heart stricter. But... For Elvis, and especially Colonel Parker, who thought that I had an agenda, that I was trying to take Elvis away from him and perhaps become his manager or lead him down a path that was contrary to what the Colonel had in mind for Elvis. I did want Elvis to wake up. And if I had an agenda, that was it. For Elvis to wake up and to become his own man and to do the things that I know that Elvis really wanted to do. Now, at the end of Elvis's life, there's no question about it. He was on the verge and made plans to fire Colonel Parker, to cut down his entourage to four to five people. He wanted an entire new career, a new life, a new lifestyle. I could not believe how he deteriorated in the year I was gone. When I saw the CBS special, I was shocked and I was pissed. And I called Colonel Parker one of the few times. I called him and I went and met with him. How could you let him be on camera like that? And he said, you're a manager. You have to give the artist uh, uh, offers. I said, how could you? He said, I put an offer out there that was ridiculous. And I took it to Elvis and he wanted to do it. The point is, is that he wasn't in great shape when I left. When I saw that, yeah, man looked like he was going to die. And of course he did. But he didn't look like that when I left. When I saw him in Maryland, uh, he looked pretty good. Towards the end of Elvis's life, his health problems really accumulated and his health is going downhill. I'll never forget the last time he played Vegas. A lot of phenomenal things happened. One night, I walked down to the casino, I just left Elvis, and I noticed there was a large group of people roped off and they were all in front of a table watching someone gamble. And as I walked up, it was Colonel Parker by himself at the table with stacks of chips. And he was playing the sucker's game of all games. It was called the Wheel of Fortune. He's at the table and he spots me in the crowd. Larry, he said, come on, come here, come here. Sit next to me. He said, I'm not doing too well. I need some luck. Give me some good thoughts, Larry. 
I said, okay, Colonel, and I felt so uncomfortable. I really did. After about five, 10 minutes, I said, Colonel, maybe you'll do better now. I hope you will, but I have to get back upstairs because Elvis needs me. So I left. The Colonel was there for hours upon hours upon hours until like five o'clock in the morning, and he lost one and a half million dollars that night. When Elvis found out about it, he said, a million and a half dollars? That's obscene. Most people don't earn that kind of money working their whole life. And he goes and squanders money like that? He said, oh yeah, he can do it because he's got me. I'm his ransom. What's gonna happen is he's gonna have to turn around, make a damn deal with me coming back to Vegas, which I, I don't like Vegas. This is Sin City, man. I don't like it here. I'm never gonna come back here again. <laughs> Ironically, he never did. Mm. Truth of the matter is, I do resent, I have resented Colonel Parker, God bless his soul, because he's passed on. Yeah, he was a genius, but I think he made some very, very bad choices in life. We were on tour in Louisville, Kentucky, and this was about four months before Elvis passed away. And Elvis, the night before, had a very difficult time. He felt he had a fever, he felt nauseous, he felt flu-like, he couldn't sleep. He had a very, very difficult night. It was late afternoon. Dr. Nick was Elvis' doctor who traveled with us, was in the bedroom with Elvis. I was in the front room and there was a pounding on the front, on the door, which was very unusual because we owned that floor. No one was allowed there. We had security cops positioned in front of the elevators. Everything was blocked off. So who would knock on the door like that? So I immediately walked over to the door, looked through the peephole, and there's Colonel Parker, who never came to visit Elvis on tour. I opened the door, and I said, Colonel. He said, where is he? I said, well, he's in, in the bedroom. Let, let me tell him you're here. He said, no, I'm going right in. So he, with his cane, he walked past me. He opened the door, and this is what I saw. Dr. Nick was holding Elvis's head. Elvis is in the bed, semi-conscious, and he was moaning. He was, in, he was in such bad shape. And Dr. Nick was dunking Elvis' head into a bucket of ice water to revive him. The door closed. And I thought immediately, okay, this is good. This is good. Now the old man, Parker, is gonna see what's going on here. And he's gonna see how bad, the bad shape Elvis is in. And he's gonna do something about it. I mean, he can't allow this to go on. It's inhuman. 90 seconds later, the door opened up. Colonel Parker walks up to me. We stand toe to toe, and he stares coldly into my eyes. He says, now you listen to me. The only thing that's important is that that man is on stage tonight. He turned around and walked out. And my heart sank. He didn't care. He didn't care. What about Elvis? What about Elvis? Elvis is not a, a, to, a to, tomato can. He's not a commodity, he's a human being. Elvis should have gotten rid of him years and years ago. Elvis knew it. Elvis was a good guy. He was a loyal guy. Maybe he had a, a bit to do with his own masochism, but he should have gotten rid of Colonel Parker. And he knew it, and he was going to do it. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that if Elvis would have lived, he would have gotten rid of Colonel Parker. I Not promise you, now for the let me challenge. tell you something. Had he known he was going to Europe, he would have gone on the strictest regimen that anybody could. Yeah. And I promise you, when we got off that plane in London, he'd have scared people to death. He'd have sure like he the satellite would. show. Remember how he got the the That's there. right. I mean, well, then he had a charge to do something. The great thing that kept Elvis going was from one thing to the other. What happened to him is Colonel let him die of apathy. And I blame Tom Parker as more as I blame anybody in this world for putting him the way he did because Tom Parker was an illegal alien and would not go out of the country. And as a consequence, we stuck our ass over here forever. Had he toured the world outside the United States, he has still been fucking the morning. The morning Elvis died. Amen. The morning Elvis died. That's, that's why I get mad when I think about it. It's yeah. so fucking mad. The that's morning. why I, I say. Showed. That's why I say if had he gone, had we set up a if world. If he'd had another I challenge, I sat down with sure. Colonel one day. I said, you know what? I said, every damn thing is just shooting your mouth off. He got really mad at me. In fact, he called Elvis to fire me once again. And I said, 
you've got to get him out of the country. I said, we've worn this country out. You have got to get him around the world. I don't care about security. I don't care about anything. You've got to get him <clears throat> out. And he said, we can't. I said, Colonel, you can do it. It needs to be done. And I said, this will make, I said, this will change this whole guy's career. I got to tell you what the Colonel told me. I got to tell you this, Martin. This isn't defense of the Colonel. It's a fact. Oh, fuck the Colonel crap. Parker was concerned about the drugs and the guns in the other countries. No, he, he said was concerned about they, he cannot get away with carrying those guns. Mm -hmm. He cannot get away he with those pills. About himself, too. He can't do it. And we can't go there unless he can stop and not take it. He Even would if he's have. got Dr. Nick with him. Well, he would have. He said there's still a limit and it, they'll jump on it. He would have stopped, for Christ's sake. That's great. What? Hey, back the camera off for 10 minutes. No, yeah, we just moved you off. <laughs> you weren't even on camera shooting. I don't give stuff. a shit. I get mad. You know me, I get scared, but I get fucking mad. Very good. Great. All right. That's a real friend. That's a real friend that made it the end. For someone who's a friend that defends you when you're there is one thing. A friend, friend that defends you when you're not there. But a friend who gets that emotionally invested in, in your downfall after you years after you died. That's a real friend. And you could see deep in his... That bothered him. That wasn't for the camera. That was like real, it bothered him. And it still bothers him. Like you could see that distant look of like when someone's not there anymore and they're thinking and that's a, that's a friend, that's a real friend right there. That's a real friend. You, I could feel his emotion welling up in him. Mm. Respect to that matey. And yeah, it's a shame, it's a shame that Elvis but then on the other hand, no, Elvis was a fully grown man. No one can do that to a fully grown man without them. Like, no one can save you and nobody really can destroy you. It's ultimately up to you. And um, so, yeah, you can, I suppose, yeah, the colonel didn't help. And from this, it's, it seemed more like, yeah, he was bothered about the money. But yeah, ultimately, I mean, you are a man. But I think with celebrities like that, they get so used to being taken, like being handled, that they don't question the handler after a while. But yeah, respect to that last meeting. Because you can see he loved Elvis and he truly has emotional um, ties still to that whole thing. So, yeah, respect to him. But, yeah, that's the reaction. Sweet.